page 162. I care not today what the morrow may bring. I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. Jesus.
trust. He is always there for me. I love him so much. He is the master. I love him. He is the master who set me free as a bird and flying kite. He is the one that died for me. I didn't deserve any of it, any at all. He is the master, I love him. He is the master who set me free as a burden flying high. He is the master, I love him. He is the master who set me free as a bird and flying high, flying high. I believe we could probably uh, we could probably go home now, just being blessed just by the the few songs that we've heard tonight. But if tonight the message is for no one else, it's for me, and I covet your prayers. I want to preach on this thought: what faith can do. Philippians chapter number four, verse number thirteen, very familiar passage of scripture, but it's one that we will read and then kind of go in a different direction. 
And I realize as far as um, um, preaching, that's probably not the best thing to do. But uh, that's what we're going to do anyway. You can tell you can tell anybody on me that you want to. But Philippians chapter 4, verse number 13, the scripture says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I want to read it again. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. He continues to give strength. Who is he? It's Christ. It's not you and I. It's not the church. It's not the pastor. It's Christ. It's not ourselves. That's very important to hear tonight. It's not ourselves. So we preach on this thought, what faith can do. And we'll switch gears a little bit over to the book of Hebrews. We'll mainly be in the book of Acts. Very confusing uh, uh, message tonight as far as scripture references. Just bear with me. Brother Jim, you may have been more right than you thought when you swung by the office and said, no, I don't want to hear that one tonight. Uh, but uh, over in the book of Hebrews, the writer says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. That, that same writer said, now faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. But in this day that we live, faith is a necessity. In many countries, we know that it's it's faith that gets you out your front door. There's such violence and trouble that, that you have to be close to God in faith before you ever step out of the front door. And the case is true even in our day in America, in the small small town of America, so that we, we really need faith, Brother Stanley, before we step out the door, before we go to the house of God, before we go to the grocery store. Uh, before we go to take the kids to school or whatever the case may be. Faith is a necessity. I wonder, could you imagine going through life not believing in anything? Not having that concrete foundation that's been uh, placed in our heart through faith uh, that Jesus Christ is Lord over all. But I wonder uh, how it would be if we didn't believe in anything. Faith is exercised for salvation, but it's also exercised in our walk with Christ. And Paul, uh, he said in Colossians, As ye therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. How do we walk in Christ? Through faith. Uh, there's a sin among Christians, and I myself am guilty oftentimes, and that sin is little Or no faith. You remember the story in the Gospels when they were in a storm. And Jesus had told them to go to the other side. And uh, that's where Peter uh, walked on the water. And he got in the boat and he mentioned about the faith. You remember when Jesus was in the bottom of the boat. He was asleep in the bottom of the boat and a storm came. And they did everything they could to control him. Finally went down and said, Master, why are you sleeping? We're perishing. He came up and he spoke to the winds. He spoke to the rain and to the waters and to the seas. But faith was on trial there, to be quite honest. Some believed God in principle. But not in practice. Some believe in faith, Sister Deborah, that God is going to do something. But there are times that God calls you to step out in faith. And rather to believe in God, He desires that you believe God. Abraham said, or or the writer of Hebrews, I believe it was, Brother John, said Abraham believed God. Now we understand they believed in God. But he believed God. He believed what God said he would do. And I believe there are times when God calls us to be... I I don't want you to take offense of this. He doesn't call us necessarily to be like Abraham and and sacrifice our own child. But what He does do is calls us us to believe God, regardless of what we've heard, regardless of all those things, but to truly step out in faith. What can faith do? What does it do? Number one, I want you to notice we're going to turn over to Acts chapter number 27 now. I want you to know that faith produces boldness. 
Acts chapter 27, verse number 1, and then verse 21 and 22, it says, And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. So here was Paul, a prisoner, and he was on a ship. He was carried on a ship with other prisoners. And now we see in verse number 21, we may make reference to, to these other things, but there's a storm that came up named Eurachlodon. And this storm was like a cyclone, a tornado, a hurricane, if you will, uh, over the ocean. And it says this storm came and they tried everything that they could. And verse 21 says, but after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. Faith will give you a boldness that you didn't think you had. Now, understand Paul had already told them in previous verses, listen, I know we're on a boat. I know that we got to get somewhere, but we need to stay here. We need not to leave port. We're safe here. We need to stay. And the Bible says in verse number 11, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. He had disobeyed Paul's Paul's uh, uh, statements And they found themselves now, verse number 11, down through verse number 20, or verse 14 down through 20, uh, they found themselves in a storm. And after long abstinence, Paul's faith uh, began to speak and said, you should have listened. This is not an I told you so moment. This is one of those moments where he says, I've taken all I can. You need to understand what I told you then is truth. And so is this. That God will deliver us, but we will lose the ship. He says here that uh, we see here that there's a boldness as a prisoner. We understand that he is a prisoner, but we also understand about verse number 21 and verse number 22, how that he was bold as a preacher. He says that I exhort you to be of good cheer. That's what that gospel is. Though we don't see that he preached the gospel, we understand that when he says be of good cheer, he said I've got good news. And brother Kenny, I don't know about you, but if I was on a ship that was about to go down and somebody told me we're going to lose the ship, but our lives are going to be saved, brother, I believe I'd get excited. And Paul says there is a, or the scripture relays to us that there is a boldness here that comes by faith. It could be that God's calling someone tonight to boldness. It could be tonight that God's calling you to, to after a long time of abstinence to stand and begin to speak for the Lord. Number two, I want you to know that faith is encouraged by promises. We come from verse 21, verse 22. He says at the end of 22 that we'll not lose any man's life but of the ship. Verse 23, for there stood by me this night the angel of God whose I am and whom I serve. He says in verse 24, saying, fear not, Paul, how thou must be brought before Caesar and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. For, what's this say? Somebody help me. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told. Brother Jody, he didn't say I believe in God. He said I believe God. No matter what he says... I believe God. Amen. And that's where we need to get. But faith is encouraged by promises. I want you to see the source of the promises. We see that there there was an angel that came. But this angel was speaking on the behalf of God. Amen. He says that there was an angel that stood by me. Who's uh, an angel of God. That's the important part. Whose I am and whom I serve. Brother Jamie, he didn't say I serve the angel. He didn't say that I, I am of the angel. But he's talking about God. And there is good news from heaven. Amen. There's good news from God that we can press on. Amen. 
there's a source of promises. And you better, better take note of the promises of God. I realize that as we go through the scriptures, there's promises to the children of Israel and there's promises to this uh, 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 tribe of Israel and to this one and to that one. But I believe that uh, if we do it right, I believe if we study it right, preacher John, I believe that we can get in there and we can claim some of those promises. But you know what? Outside of the of the scripture, God gives us some promises, Sister Mildred, in ourselves. Through that Holy Spirit, He begins to speak to us. Through that scripture, He begins to speak to us. But through the peace and the conviction maybe of God, and through the faith in God, He gives us, Brother John, some promises that we can hold on to, that we can claim. I believe that these promises... Are encouraging by faith. Look at, look at the, the, the scope of the promise. Verse number 24, it says these words. He said, you, you need to be bought, brought before Caesar. And God hath given thee all that sail with thee. It reminds me over there in Acts chapter number. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Was it Acts chapter 16, I believe? That was an earthquake, chapter 16, verse number 26. The jailer came in and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. That was some mamas and daddies down here praying this morning. That's some mamas and papas down here praying this morning. I wonder if it might be that faith has encouraged you through the promises of God that even your house might be saved. That son, that daughter... That daughter-in-law, that son-in-law, that nephew, that that brother, that sister might be saved. And you, you remember, you remember that 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 crippled man, Sister Irene. He was born of four. He was brought to Jesus. He couldn't walk. We see no record, Sister Irene, that he even asked to go to Jesus. But by the faith of those four men, they took off the roof and they lowered him down right at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus touched him. He healed him, but he also saved him. We see nothing about this man. We don't see anything about his prayer. Makes makes me wonder, Brother Jim, if the prayer of others, if the prayer and the faith of others might be able to get a hold of God. For one person to be saved. Now I believe. I believe the scripture brother Jamie. Jesus was there. Don't misunderstand me. Jesus seen this young man. Or this old man. Whatever he may have been. And he healed him brother Gene, brother Jim. He healed him. But then he saved him. But there was faith. On someone else's part as well. I love the fact that they broke the roof off. If it had been today's time, we'd have went to the front door and we looked in and seen the crowd like we had this week, we'd have turned around and left. We'd have drove by and seen the parking lot, people parking in the grass and everywhere else. We said, no, I ain't even going to try that. That church don't look big enough to hold all those people. I'm just going to go on. They didn't care, Sister Cheryl. They didn't care. They went to the front door, couldn't in, went to the window, couldn't get in. And they said, you know what? I see a staircase. Let's get up there. They started tearing off the thatch. And they found some ropes and they laid him down at the feet of Jesus. We need that kind of faith to help someone else get to Jesus. Amen. Faith is encouraged by promises. The scope of all the promises. He says, God hath given thee all that sail with thee. He said, Paul, not only are you going to be saved, but everybody on this boat, because of your faith, is going to be saved. Brother Jody, I was going to use Brother David, but we use David all the time. But Brother David, the same thing. You've got men, maybe even women that work for you that that don't know the Lord. Brother Jody, you've, you've probably got some young men that don't know the Lord. 
Well, Jamie, same with you. Probably got some men that don't know the Lord. I wonder if it could be your faith. I wonder if it could be your faith that takes, takes them to the feet of Jesus. I wonder if your not them, but I wonder if it might be your faith that takes them and lays them down at the feet of Jesus. And then from there, from there, it's the work of Christ. Because if I'm not mistaken, unless I got my stories mixed up, he said, take up your bed. They didn't carry him home. As far as I know, they didn't even carry his bed for him. He got that bed up and he started running. You see, we need the faith that will carry somebody to Jesus. Amen. I got to go. I got to go. Number three, I want you to know that faith weathers the storm. Look with me. Chapter number 27, still chapter number 27, verse number 26. It says, how be it? <laughs> he gave good news, Sister Cheryl. He said, ain't nobody going to die. Whoopee and hallelujah. But Paul said, we must be cast upon a certain island. He said, fellas, I want you to know nobody's going to die. Buford, he said, ain't nobody going to die. He said, we're going to be shipwrecked. He said, I don't have all the answers. I do know that we're going to live, but I also know we're going to end up on an island, and I don't know anything else beyond that. But I'm glad, listen to me, I'm about, about ran through that back door right there. Listen, there's going to be some times when God tells you to do some things. You don't know what's on the other side of that. God doesn't call us to know what's on the other side of that. All He calls us to do is what He's told us to do. And if we're obedient to do what He's told us to do and stay with the ship, stay on the boat, keep everybody together, God will get us where He wants us to go. Can somebody help me tonight? Believe me, I'm telling you, there, there's, there's some things in my life right now that God's told me to do. I don't understand it, but I know that God is sovereign over all. I don't understand it, but I know God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I don't understand it, but listen to me, I know that God is in control. Amen. Faith weathers the storm. There's a storm of persecution. Maybe you're at work. Maybe you're at school. You're scared to death to stand up and tell anybody. I know there's some homeschoolers in here. You're scared to death to stand up at school and talk about Jesus. That's all right. It's just brother and sister and mom and daddy to say on. But listen, maybe you go to a public school. Maybe you have a public job and you're scared of what people might think. I'm not, this is not a sales pitch, but you're scared to put something like this on the back of your car because you're afraid of what somebody might say. What's that, what's that lady's name? This has been recorded, but I'm trying not to say much about it. What's that lady's name that ran for office against Kemp? You probably voted for it, didn't you? Stacy Abrams. You'll put a Stacy Abrams sticker on the back of your car, but you won't put nothing about God on there. You got one on there, Sister Deborah? She said, mm-mm. You'll put something about Disney World or anything else, but we won't put anything about God. You see, it could be <clears throat> these storms of perfection, <laughs> persecution rather, it could be that God puts us in that place yeah. so that we can get a little heat from the world That's right. to see how strong we are, see how long we're going to stay in the fight. When you get in that heat, when God puts you in that heat, Brother David, it's for a reason. It's for a reason. Hey. He doesn't do it just, just because. Hey. Those three Hebrew boys, they ended up in the fire not just because. They ended up in the fire for at least two reasons. One, to see how strong their faith was. But two, to show the king of a pagan world how big he was. It wasn't long, Kaylee, and somehow or another he knew what the Son of God looked like. Yeah. He said, did we not cast three men into the fire? And they said, yes, sir. Miss Pat, and they said, well, why in the world do I see four? And one looks like the Son of God. You see, it could be when you get put into the fire, it might be so you can have fellowship with God. About, it might be because you can have fellowship with God. 
<laughs> brother, brother Jamie, I know, I know you've had some changes in your life, but brother, it could be when we end up in the fire, it could be because God just wants some time of fellowship with us. He don't want anybody else around. Just you and I. He just he wants to burn off our fetters. He wants to burn off everything that doesn't belong in our lives. And but when we come out, we're not going to smell like smoke. We're not going to smell like the fire. But bless God, there'll be a light that's within us, and people can tell that we've been with Jesus. Amen. There's a storm of adversity. <clears throat> adversity. Finances could be your marriage, could be your children. One person said, a married couple came to him and he said, we're having marital problems. He said, well, of course you are. You're married. What other kind of problems do you think you're going to have? You got children? You better believe there's going to be some days that you're going to Wake up worried about them children. There's going to be some days that you go to bed and you pillow your head tonight maybe even worried about those children. I'm not being funny. It ain't funny not one lick. This afternoon I took a nap and I woke up. I was sweating to death. I was scared to death because I was on a ship somewhere. I was on a ship somewhere and there was Katie Rogers was there and the little girl that came with Ashlyn was there. Her name's Abby and... Ashlyn and Braylon and a bunch of other young folks. And there was a bunch of adults. And everybody, all them children, were saved except my two. And they perished. Man, my heart. My heart was beating. My alarm went off. I said, Sister Barbara, I said, there's no way I can wake up now. I got to make sure. Now, I knew I was dreaming. I said, I got to go back to sleep and see if I can find them. And I, I remember going, finding land, and I remember going to a hospital. Nobody would help. Nobody would help. I'd go to another hospital, and they wouldn't help. And finally, I just had to make myself wake up because my mind was racing. And I knew Ashlyn was, or Braylon was with Brother Terry, and I knew Ashlyn was in the bed in there. And I knew we weren't on a ship, but I'm going to tell you something. There was fear. There was panic in this daddy's heart. Well, David, Abby, I hope, I hope this don't freak you out, but tomorrow Abby's going to drive home. Autumn's going to drive home, Mamma. There's a lot of things can happen in that two hours or so. We, we worry about our kids. The other night, the other night we was laying in bed and we'd had a little incident. A little girl got sick at the house. <clears throat> we got that cleaned up, Brother Joey. Me and Lori laid back down. All of a sudden, Ashlyn come running into our bedroom, screaming bloody murder. And said, there's somebody knocking at the door. There's somebody outside and they're beating on the garage door. So I got up and I grabbed the gun and I'm looking out the front door. I wasn't going out the front door, but bless God, I was looking out the front door. And by the time I went to go check on the, on the garage, I heard it. And Lori heard it at the same time. You know that little girl that was here? She got sick that night. She got sick on a, that blanket that, that you made, Hannah. We had it in the washing machine. And that thing got off, off level. And that thing was beating. Boom, boom, boom. I heard that thing beating. I realized it wasn't no stranger out there in the garage. I waved that gun around. I said, y'all better get to bed right now. There's times we worry about our children. I worry about that one more so than I worry about this one over here. That one's, both of them scared. They're just like their daddy. I can't say nothing about them too bad. But listen, there may be storms. I'm trying to hurry. There may be storms of adversity. Storms of sickness. Young man was here this morning. Brother uh, brother Rick, uh, your stepdad, just went through a storm dealing with prostate cancer. Brother John back there waving his hand. Just went through storm. Hatter's been going through storm. We can probably go from every pew tonight. Some are still going through storms of sickness. But can I tell you, faith will take you through. Faith will take you through. The storm of temptation. The Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter number, uh, chapter number 13, uh, verse number 13. Listen to this real quick. 
There is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Somebody help me. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you, will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. The Bible gives us here a picture of what in the Old Testament is known as a scapegoat. And I'd like to read it. But he says over in Leviticus chapter 16 verse number 7. says, And Aaron shall take two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle. And Aaron shall cast lots on the two goats. One for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon the uh, which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall bring the goat uh, uh, for a sin offering, excuse me. But the goat on which the uh, lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord and make atonement. If somebody don't say amen when I get done with this verse, I'm going to shoot you. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to be let go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Hey, I'm glad that on Calvary there was a scapegoat picture there. He said there's one lamb that needs to be offered and one lamb, one last lamb. I said one last lamb uh, that would cover, that would atone the sins of all the world, of both future, present, and past. And I'm telling you, he was let loose into the world as an atonement, as a scapegoat for you and I. All those sins of the camp of Israel uh, were placed upon the head of that lamb. One was sacrificed. And one was let go. A picture of salvation for you and I. A picture of atonement for you and I. We don't have to bear those sins. There's a storm of temptation. And every temptation, every solicitation to do evil, God makes a way of escape. If I can say this, Jesus Christ is the way of escape. Every single time. Let's go look at this. Number four, faith silences the enemy. Look with me in the following chapter, chapter number 28. They've now found themselves shipwrecked. And it says in verse number, uh, we'll read verse number one and verse number two. And when they were escaped and they knew that the island was called Melita and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. For they kindled a fire and received us, every one, because of the present rain and because of the cold. Here was a people, Hannah, that were barbarians. They didn't know the right thing to do. They apparently never heard the gospel or anything else. We can go down and we can see how their their uh, their thought processes worked about gods and punishment, things of that sort. He said, we were in a barbarous people. And they showed us no little kindness. Now that's that's an old English way of saying they couldn't stop showing us kindness. They kept on and on and on. They're on the, the island of Malta. They're surrounded by these strangers. And, and they, they literally kept showing kindness. In, in Psalm 23, verse number 5. Now, in, in, as, far, as far as accounts, this people, this barbarous people, uh, they, according to a tradition, a barbarian is one that doesn't care for life. A barbarian is one that doesn't care for outsiders and will at the moment's notice take someone's life. But instead of that, they showed kindness. Psalm 23, verse number 5. It says, Thou preparest a table before me. Where? In the presence of mine enemies. David says, listen, right in the middle of all of my valleys, right in the middle of all of the things that I'm going through, when the enemies are encamped round about me, God says, listen, I've got a plan. And he says, I'm going to put this table out here. you got an enemy on the right, the left, in front, behind you. But don't worry, I've prepared this table. And he pulls out a white uh, tablecloth. He sets it. He prepares the meal. And he allows us to scoot up under that with a peace knowing that though the enemy be around us, he's prepared it and he'll protect us. Amen. Amen. Faith, faith will help us against the adversary. 
Proverbs 16, verse number 7. When a man's way please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Now that's hard for us to believe. And sometimes we see something that may seem opposite. But I still believe the scripture. Let's do it again. Way please the Lord. He maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. I've often had this picture in my mind that when we go to battle in this world, when we have to face the devil, and the truth be known, Brother Jody, very rarely do we ever fight the devil. I don't think we have, I know we don't have the strength, but I don't think any of us, and I don't mean this bad, but I don't think any of us really have the importance yet to really fight the devil. I think he just sends some of his little demons after us. But I wonder if when, when we're in the battle against the devil, if you will, against his demons. Well, John, I wonder if they see who's behind us. Because the scripture says, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Were you ever? I know you were a kid, but as a kid, did you ever say, my daddy can whoop your daddy? My big brother can whoop your brother? You ever thought about that, Brother Kenny? Jesus is our brother. God is our father. He said he never leave us nor forsake us. When we begin to fight against the wickedness of this world, we can say to the world and to the devil, eyeball to eyeball, my daddy can whoop you. My daddy can, when we're fighting this world, my daddy can whoop the world's daddy, the devil. Makes me wonder maybe if when we face some of these things, Brother Jamie, that the devil don't cower Because it's not us, but because of who's behind us or who's beside us. Faith can silence the adversary. Look at this. Faith presses towards the goal. Chapter 28, verse number 11. The Bible says this. And after three months we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. And landed at Syracuse, and we tarried there three days. And from whence we fetched a compass and came to somewhere. Uh, And after one day, the south wind blew, and we came the next day to Petuli. Where we found brethren, and we desired to tarry with them seven days. So we went towards Rome. Philippians 3.13 says we can forget those things which are behind There are times that some of the only words that you need to remember at a time is press on. There's times that as we face a battle, the words that need to come out of our mouth and out of our heart is press on. Don't give up. Just press on. You go back to Psalm 23. He says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He didn't, he didn't put up a tent. He didn't dwell there. He didn't build a homestead there, Brother Jim. What did he do? He walked through it. And there's going to be times that you've got to walk through some stuff. But Brother Jody, you can't walk through it unless you press on. Amen. I can't get to that door unless I walk through that aisle. But oftentimes we're discouraged because of a lack of faith. He said it's too hard. Too high of a mountain. Too low of a valley. Too wide of a river. And we quit. It could be that we quit right before the blessing. It could be. Remember, remember what I said earlier that God tells us to do something if we're obedient and do it. We don't know what's on the other side. It could be that as long as Buford, as long as we do what God tells us to do and we continue to press on, it could be just on the other side of the obstacle. There's the blessing that God wants us to have all the time. But so often, Sister Irene, 
we go just far enough for our body to give out. And we say, I can't do it anymore. And we miss the blessing that lies just beyond what God's asked us to do. We didn't have a song this morning. I want us to have a a song tonight, if you don't mind. Philippians 3.13 said, I want you to forget those things which are behind. Reach forth unto those things which are before. Those things which are ahead. Verse 14 of chapter 3 of Philippians said, Press toward the mark, the prize of the high calling. What can faith do? What can faith do? I think I made mention of this a while back. How many daddies have been been doing their own thing and their little girl or their little boy brought a broken toy and said, Daddy, fix it. There's no questions as to if Daddy could fix it. There's no question, Daddy, can you fix it? There was just trust in Daddy to fix it. What about that mama? She's cleaning house. She's working this. She's doing that. She's at the computer. And all of a sudden her ears perk up because one of her babies is crying. And that baby runs straight to mama. Or maybe they lay down and they're crying for mama. They don't say, mama, can you kiss it? Can you make it better? They just cry, mama, make it better. Mama, kiss it. You know, sometimes... Brother Kenny, sometimes all it is is mama's mama's presence. Sometimes that's all that little baby wants. You know them little little lying babies? I don't know if if, that's Austin, right? I don't know if he's a liar yet or not, but both mine were born liars. They'd be laying in their crib, their pack and play, their whatever whatever that might be, and they start they start crying. Oh, they're dirty, or oh, they're wet, or oh, they're hurt. And you walk over there and you look at them, they just look at you. You walk away, Brother Kenny, they start crying again. You walk back and they stop, and you reach down and you pick them up, and they're just as happy. They never cry again. It might be tonight in somebody's life that you're doing just that. You're crying. You're whining on for the Lord. You don't really need anything. You just want Him to pick you up. You just want to be held. Faith will allow that. Maybe you're facing one of those storms. Faith can get you through. Now I'm not talking about you get the news of cancer and you tell somebody and you just say, Oh, I'll pray for you. That's not the casual faith that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the faith that believes that if we have cancer, God can heal. I'm talking about the faith that those boys had when they were cast into the fire. And they say, we believe that God can deliver us, but if not, we will not bend, bow, or burn. That's the kind of faith we need. Let's come this morning, this evening. Let's just... Spend some time with the Lord tonight. I kept you a lot longer than I expected. And I apologize. But somebody might just need to call out to God about faith. Maybe you've got it. Maybe you have faith. But it's weak. Maybe your faith is strong tonight. And there's a burden that you need to pray about. There's someone that you need to pray about. You just need to lay it down on the altar. Maybe you believe in God. But you fail to believe God. You've heard about all of the other things that God can do, but you failed to experience it yourself. Dear Father, we come to you tonight. We ask you, Lord, to touch this evening. God, you know in my own heart, my own life, God, faith, Lord, it's become something that I've I've had to come to terms with. God, even this week, Lord, you've dealt with my heart about faith. Father, I'm thankful for it. God, in my own flesh, I'm worried and I'm scared. But God, I, I believe you. 
God, tonight when I pillow my head, my flesh will probably begin to ask questions. But I believe you. God, I ask you tonight that you would help someone that might be here. They're struggling with their faith. It's weak. God, will you strengthen their faith? God, someone may be right in the middle of all of their enemies. I pray, Lord, that you silence those enemies for them. God, if there's someone, their faith, Lord, is not what it used to be. I pray that you'd restore it. But I ask you to do a work in our church. Lord, these are giants that I'm standing among tonight. These are people that have stood with the stuff for years and years. And God, I love them. And God, I want what's best for them. And I pray tonight, God, that you would allow us as a body of believers to move beyond believing in God and to move into the realm of believing God. Father, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand tonight. If you need to come to this altar, you come.